His most recent book is The American Presidency, a glorious burden. We exhibit uh, another division of the exhibit, a section of it, which is for traveling purposes at the Society now. And there are some programs over there if you want to pick them up at the end. But Lonnie holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in American and African American history from the American University. He is also an adjunct professor of museum studies at George Washington University and a documentary filmmaker. He is active in the service of the museum historical profession, serving on the Council of the Association for State and Local History, on the editorial board of the Public Historian, and the Accreditation Commission of the American Association of Museums, and the Museums and Historians Task Force, and he was elected to the American Antiquarian Society this year. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Illinois Historical Preservation Society. And an internet, an eternal thing at the CHS to ask Lonnie's interest, of course, is family, history, automobiles, and cars. <laughs> Talk to him about those things. I say that if they have Mr. Congeniality Awards at museum and history professions, it would be very tough to beat Lonnie. So it's my pleasure to introduce him here, and I'm sure you'll be glad to hear him. There is nothing more dangerous than giving a historian a microphone and a captive audience and standing between a group of people that want to eat. But I will try hard to be a <laughs> Let me begin with a story uh, that really gets to this point of why history is so important to us all. About 15 years ago, early in my career, I was asked by the Smithsonian to run a major project, an exhibition, that would look at the history of 19th century America. And I wanted to do something on slavery. And I wanted to find a slave cabin to bring back to the Smithsonian. So I found out about a series of slave cabins outside of Georgetown, South Carolina, the old Waccamaw Neck. And I went to these, to these slave cabins, and I was taken in an old four-wheel drive back into the swamps, this was an old rice plantation, back through the swamps, and suddenly we turned a corner and there were 25 slave cabins extant. It was a major, major moment for a historian. And I was quite fortunate that one of the people there was a Mr. Johnson. He was 96 years old, and he had lived in the slave cabin with his slave mother and grandma. And so therefore he could tell me stories about the cabin. So when I got there, I said, let's walk around the cabin so I will learn about it. So he started by taking me to the front of the cabin. And he talked about how the slaves would use a broom to do the hard sweep, to get the grass away so that no vermin would be there. He took me to one side and he talked about the chimney and the role of the slave children in making sure the chimney didn't fall or catch on fire. He took me to the back of the cabin and he showed me where his grandmother grew food to supplement what the slave owners gave him. But then we went to the fourth side of the cabin, and I said, what happened over here, Mr. Johnson? He wouldn't come. So I went around again with him. He told me a few more stories. We got back to the fourth side, and I said, Mr. Johnson, why don't you come over here and talk to me about what happened over here? He said, I'm not going and I thought that somehow, as a young scholar, I had discovered something special. Maybe it was a slave cemetery, something spiritual, something that I was going to make my career on. And I said, Mr. Johnson, would you please come over here? And he said, no. And I said, why won't you come over here? He said, because rattlesnake's over there. <laughs> let me keep walking amongst the rattlesnakes. And he said to me, he said, well, first of all, he said, because he thought I was this smart guy from Washington, I was supposed to know better. But then he said, the truth of the matter is, he said, everybody from around here knows the history of that spot. It's dangerous if you live your life and not know your history. And I've always kept that in mind when I began to think about the power of the past and the importance of history as a way to avoid the pitfalls, the rattlesnakes of life, if you will. And so I'd like to talk to you today briefly, as brief as a historian can be, briefly about 
the power of African American history, and really talk a little bit about what I think are the sort of five lessons that are crucial for us that African American history can help us wrestle with as we learn to live our lives. Now, there are many stories I can tell you about history, but I would argue that one of the most important things that we can think about about African American history is really looking at what Carter G. Woods the man who founded Negro History Week and ultimately Negro History Month, believed. He believed that history, African American history, was really an opportunity to help the struggle for civil rights. That knowing the past, using the past, finding an African American past would really provide a weapon to help change society. And that notion is really what motivates a lot of us who work. We're interested in the past because it's a wondrous story, but we're also interested in the past as a means of transformation and a means of achieving the civil rights long denied. Now, one of the things that I think is really important for all of us to think about is when we really look at black history, what are we really doing? In some ways, Carter G. Woodson felt that Negro History Month, as he created it, and the use of black history would do something really important. He thought that by celebrating heroic figures, whether they were inventors or lawyers or soldiers, that that would help to prove the worth of African Americans. That would prove to white America that African Americans played an important role in this country. So therefore, it was important to understand that history to embrace that history, to prove that we were contributing members of society. But ultimately, what he saw black history as a vehicle for racial change, and I would argue that in some ways, the fundamental question before us today is, is black history still a tool for racial change? Is it something we ought to use to help transform society? And the reason I pose this is because I was just the other day having a conversation with my two daughters who were tired of hearing historical stories. <laughs> but they said to me, Dad, why should we really care about black history? After all, America has changed. I see Colin Powell on TV. I have friends that are black and white. I look at American culture and I see African American culture everywhere. Why is it so important for us to care about the past? Well, after the four-hour lecture they received, um, I thought a lot about it. And I'd like to share with you my thoughts about the power of the past. I would like to suggest that despite the profound changes that have occurred in America, black history, the knowledge of black history, the meaning of black history is just as strong, just as relevant today as it ever was. I would argue that understanding the African-American past is still that beacon of change and possibility that we so, norm so desperately need. I would argue that, oh, the chains of slavery are gone, but we are not yet free. I would argue that the great diversity that within African-Americans reminds us that we need a glue to keep us together. And that glue is the African-American past. I would argue that African-American history is still so relevant today because while it helps us understand where we've gone and what we've accomplished, it also reminds us how much further we have to go. I think there are many reasons and many examples that I could point to, but let me try to be brief and give you what I think are the five challenges that African-Americans, that Americans face today, that a knowledge of the black past can help us address. First is the challenge of forgetting. You can tell a great deal about a country and a people by what they deem important to remember, by what they deem important to create monuments about, or what they put in their museum. Just look around the world. In Scandinavia, there are hundreds of monuments and museums that celebrate the Vikings and the spirit of exploration in Scandinavia. 
Or if you look in Germany in the 30s and 40s during the Nazi era, there were monuments and songs that were created to celebrate a German past that they thought <coughs> was usable. In America, when we look at our museums, we look at our monuments, they are traditionally proven either by a relevance and reverence for the founding fathers or by a desire to look at some civil war battle or another. But I would argue more than what we remember, you can tell more about a country by what it forgets, by what it doesn't explore, by what it leaves out of the historical narrative. And I would suggest to you that African American history is really a clarion call for all of us, all Americans, to remember. It is a call that often is unheeded. And I would like to give you an example of where I think it's unheeded, where it's one of the great interesting things that this country needs to wrestle with. Let's take the example of one of the great unmentionables, slavery. For nearly 250 years, slavery existed. But not only did it exist, it was one of the dominant forces in American life political clout, economic fortune, all depended upon the labor of slaves. And the presence of this peculiar institution shaped American culture in ways we still have not discovered. And yet, as Americans, while we can discuss some of the common information about slavery, we may know that there were four million slaves in 1860. And we may even know that it cost $1,100 to buy a prime male slave and $1,500 to buy a prime female slave. But we really as a country, we really as a people, haven't wrestled with the contemporary meaning, the legacy, the impact of slavery on all of us today. And the best example of that I can give you <coughs> is that when I was working on this project for the Smithsonian on the history of slavery, the Smithsonian was very nervous, very concerned that, they were gonna, that we were going to tell the story of slavery. So they demanded that we do a survey to find out what people thought about slavery. So we interviewed 10,000 people. And of those 10,000 people, what was so fascinating is 92% of the white respondents felt that slavery had little or no meaning for them. Most tended to say, my family wasn't even here when slavery came or I was born in the North, or though I was born in the South, I didn't own slaves. Even more disturbing, however, was the fact that 79% of African Americans said slavery had no meaning for them, or they were embarrassed by their slave past. I would argue that's a really important issue for Americans, and African Americans specifically, to wrestle with. I would argue that exploring black history can help us stimulate a discussion about this subject that is so crucial for our future. As a historian, I have always felt that slavery, in some ways, is an African-American success story. And before people jump on me, let me explain what that means. We, as a people, have found ways to survive, to persevere to preserve culture, to keep families together. While slavery is ripe with the stories we talk about, the stories of heroes like Harriet Tubman, or Sojourner, or, or um, um, Denmark Vesey. But I would argue equally important are the unnamed slaves, the men and women who kept families together, the men and women who refused to allow an institution to break them or to destroy their culture. I am not embarrassed by my slave ancestors. In fact, I'm in awe of their strength, their resiliency, their ability to survive, their ability to persevere. I would love to see the African American community rethink its own relationship with slavery. Because in some ways, until we embrace our slave past, we're never going to embrace the future we all want. I would also argue that for me, the best way to think about slavery is from a comment that I read in the slave narratives 
by a slave from South Carolina, William Prescott, who when he was interviewed in 1939, just before he died, he was asked, is it important to know about slavery? And he said, isn't it a shame that sure enough, real soon, there will be no one alive that will be a slave? And you know what's sad about that? Is that everybody will remember that we were sold, but they won't remember that we were strong. I think that is the message we ought to have as a country about slavery. Secondly, it seems to me there's the challenge of confrontation and perseverance. America revels in its greatness. America loves to talk about what we've accomplished, what we do well. But we're less comfortable shedding the light on the darker corners of the American man. Less comfortable boil, lancing the boil. And I would argue that if we can look at history, and especially African American history, we can help the country heal. We can help the country build upon its past rather than avoiding some aspects of that past. Let me give you the example I have of that. Just take the story of African American males over the last 120 years. Despite the fact that during slavery, African American males were always depicted as docile and gentle, white America has always been afraid of, of black males. To Jefferson, he once said the presence of African-American males is like having a wolf by the ear. Sooner or later, it's going to get you. From 1881 to 1917, every year, nearly 100 black males were lynched. And since then, generations of black men have found themselves on chain gangs or in prison. Yet I would argue the story is not simply a negative one. While America is a country that revels in the ratio algebra myth of people who work hard and who get a little luck and who improve themselves, they never talk about African Americans as part of that ratio algebra myth. And yet I would argue that turning the other side of the coin, there are literally thousands of black men who have worked hard, who have persevered, who have raised families, who have contributed mightily to the success of America. And it's only by understanding the fullness of the African-American past. Can you understand all of that? I would also argue the third challenge is something that you today know very well, because we're here celebrating Al-Assad. It is the challenge of preserving a people's culture. While the African-American community is no longer invisible, I am not sure that as a community, we take seriously the requirement to preserve our culture. The requirement to preserve it, be it in a church, be it in a school, be it in your own home. I would argue that's crucially important, not only because institutions need that history, but truthfully, museums, libraries, archives, whether they like it or not, legitimize people's culture. If you are not there, in the minds of many, you are not legitimate. It is crucially important as we interpret our past that we remember to preserve both the past and the present by working with organizations like the Amistad, or, may I put a commercial in, like the Chicago Historical Society. <laughs> and I would argue that is really important because when you look and work with organizations to preserve culture, interesting things happen. The most amazing museum in the world, I would argue, is a museum called the District 6 Museum. It's located in Cape Town, South Africa. This is a small little community museum that celebrated a community that was destroyed by apartheid. They chased the mixed race community away. They knocked down most of the buildings. Then 50 years later, they created a museum. And the museum began in a simple way, with a map on a floor that identified every house that is now destroyed. And it allowed people to come back to the community that they were chased out of and put a note down mark where they live, suddenly find new friends and old neighbors. And in a way, this kind of museum has stimulated not only the preservation of culture in South Africa, but it stimulated, in order to record some of the history of Chicago, done about 200 oral histories, some 
of whom in this room Judge Cus Justice Cousins being one of those of three generations, bridges of memory, three generations of African Americans who grew up in Chicago. So that part of history, which Dr. Brunch has just indicated being very important, transfers from Africa into the South and slavery and into the urban centers like Chicago, where some of us, my parents came to Chicago a, a month after the race riot of 1919. And I was uh, uh, eight months old. I had protested and decided I didn't want to stay in Birmingham any longer. And so my mother said, the boy can't even change his diaper, so I'm coming with him. And uh, so here we are. But uh, it's not my task to talk about that at this point. It's my honor because I have had the, have had the good fortune to have met a Dr. Brunch almost right after he uh, arrived here and we have uh, on occasion uh, been together on uh, many other events. This is for me uh, very unique because of this particular history of the Armstead Society, the Friends of Armstead, uh, and Willie Lee Hart has always uh, told me to be here, and uh, so in her quiet way, you do not deny that, that request, and I, would, I didn't know I was to do what I'm supposed to, what I'm getting ready to do now. Dr. Brunch, it is my honor to present to you this award, which reads, Armstead 2000, Irma Ken Ken Kensley Johnson Distinguished Service Award presented to Mr. Lonnie G. Brunch for outstanding dedication to education, to humanity, and to community service with special interest in preserving African American history. Chicago Friends of the Armstead Research Center, Willie Lee Hart President, June 15, 2002. Okay. 
Uh, all, all the woman, uh, Dorothy Tillman. Hi, my name is Edmund Geringer. I'm a member of the Chicago Friends of Amistad, and I guess you can tell by my haberdashery that I'm not Dorothy Tillman. <laughs> Uh, it's my pleasure to present this Irwin Kingsley Johnson Award to uh, Miss Sherry Williams, the founder of the Bronzeville Chicago, Black Chicago Historical Society. Uh, this organization's purpose is to preserve, protect, collect, and perpetuate the records of African Americans who live in Chicago and are part of the Chicago experience. Let me... It is. Uh, the, uh, the, the plaque reads, Irwin Kingsley, jo Kingsley Johnson Distinguished Service Award presented to Bronzeville Black Chicago Historical Society for outstanding dedication to education, to humanity, and to community service, a special interest in preserving African American history. Chicago Friends of the Amistad Research Center, Willie G. Lee Hart President, June 15, 2002. This is Ms. Sherry Williams Found. Thank you. Thank you very much. out as um, being housed in Robert Taylor, um, as of 1998. In the year 2000 plus, demolition began in Robert Taylor and ultimately we lost our home um, after doing 20 years of non-for-profit work, having a worm and fish farm and also having mentors and tutoring going on in Robert Taylor Housing. So certainly this award comes as a surprise and then also it's so humbling to see that my people and my friends have acknowledged the service that our group has been giving to the community. Certainly, I'd like to acknowledge Jerry Oliver, who is sitting behind most of you. She is my mentor and my friend, Ms. Oliver, in the Brooksville community. So we were quite disappointed when it closed. Um, which will make it available to everyone um, nationwide. Success and violence, we must do a triumph over every step of construction to try to have the new for which I love. Again, I welcome you to the first school of 2002 graduation. Welcome. Thank you. 
Today I hold a record of A and B at a minimum and maximum of no C. <laughs> Just to let you know, this accomplishment will not be solved for me by the help of myself alone. I have much assistance from many. Life so far has been challenging, but as you can see, the reward is already clear. There are many people I have to acknowledge for this title that I hold today, and they are, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and Because without him, I would not be standing before you all today. I'd like to thank all the friends I've made over the years because you hold a special place in my heart that can never be replaced. And so one person who's there with me, who fights the eighth grade every day, my well-known and well-respected cousin Patrice Smith. Thank you. To all the teachers I've had over the years, thank you for showing me more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. But thank you for teaching me advocacy, determination, discipline, and dedication. I'd like to thank my whole family because when negativity escalates, your health never decreases. I want to especially thank my grandma for always being an uplifting prayer and I'm not feeling too uplifting. Thank you. Obstacles that life throws at you, nothing is too difficult to achieve. We all have the moral support from teachers, parents, and other relatives to step up through motivation. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank my family for always encouraging me to do my best and accepting nothing less. You all are the reason that I stand here today. Everyone in my family has been inspirational pillars that I can fall back on any time. They have supported me in everything that I have done, made sure that I have whatever I needed, and made sure <laughs> taught me to have nothing but the best in life. You always made sure that I'm